Ihor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Where is here? New York? New York, yeah. Long Island, actually, at the moment. We're uh, working out of uh, our offices in New York City, but uh, right now we're in uh, Long Island uh, during the pandemic. Well, this is uh, being recorded on the last day of the quarter. I can't believe it. We still have three months left in this year, 2020. We'll see what uh, the final quarter brings us. But today we're going to talk about all things short selling, uh, one of my favorite topics and something we haven't talked about that much on the podcast. Before we get deep into shorting and all that stuff, give me the one minute overview or background. What, uh, what kind of led you to the formation of S3? What was the, what was the path? Well, I started out in the controllers at Morgan Stanley got 30 years ago. Uh, we've uh, got, uh, in fact, I worked in uh, New York, Tokyo, London, Hong Kong at Morgan Stanley. Got into securities finance around 20, 25, 25 years ago now and uh, worked on the sell side. So uh, after a while of uh, being on the sell side, I thought I'd want to see the other side of the market. And Bob Sloan created this company as three partners to be a, uh, a outsourced securities finance desk for uh, the buy side. And that's why I joined. I was one of the first uh, people who joined the firm in 2003. And we kind of uh, evolved from just being a outsourced finance desk to using our FinTech products, our systems, to be a, a data and technology company. And now we supply data and, uh, and uh, information for both the buy and sell side, but predominantly on the buy side for securities finance and, uh, and uh, pricing in the market. Great. So uh, you're one of my favorite follows on Twitter on this topic. So we'll link to oh, your- uh, thank you. <laughs> we'll, link, we'll link to your handle on, um, online. I mean, shorting, is an area that I think many people, particularly the media, are enamored with. I, I also don't feel like a lot of people really understand the basics and the mechanics. Could you give us just a um, kind of one-on-one level overview of the short selling process um, and, and what's involved? Yeah, it's, it's surprising to me that, uh, yeah, well, actually most of the retail side doesn't have a great handle on the, proce on the process. And probably a lot of the institutional guys you know, know how to do a short sale, but really don't know the, the nitty gritty of how it works. Um, I mean, basically, you're looking to short a stock that you think the price is going down as either a hedge or an alpha play. Um, you're going to your broker, prime broker, you're getting a locate because every short sale has to have a stock borrow because you're delivering out shares to someone. So the broker said, yes, I can do this. I can lend you this, this stock. So if you are trying to borrow Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, or whatever, it's, it's usually a pretty easy borrow, it's pretty cheap. Uh, normal borrow cost for a, what we call a general collateral GC stock is around 30 basis points per year. So it's not a big drain on, on your alpha expectations. Uh, then you've got stocks that are much more expensive like a Nikola or a uh, GameStop, which uh, can run at times over 100%. So you better be right, you better be right pretty quick. Uh, you know, cause that's one thing that I think a lot of investors don't realize is, Hey, I made, you know, 20% return on my short play, but it cost me 18% in financing costs. So what was a good trade is really not. Uh, so, um, I think that's a great overview and the, the challenging and the position sizing and so many things go into short selling that make it, um, a lot of people want to think it's just the opposite of going long and it's, and it's really not, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, right. one of the ones, uh, which is the short sellers, uh, dreaded short squeeze, um, very quickly can turn into, um, uh, a painful sort of, uh, experience from someone who's grew up retail shorting, uh, but being on the institutional side of it now. Um, all right, so uh, I think that's a pretty good overview. What else? Um, you talk about GameStop. You talk about Tesla. You know, Tesla. I feel like is the use case that like everyone wants to talk about. Could you give us maybe just like a walkthrough a little bit about um, an overview of? Shorting, um, I think at one point you called Tesla the most unprofitable uh, short I've ever seen. And I think this was pre-2020. Yeah. Uh, maybe just talk to us a little bit about uh, 
shorting within the context of, of Tesla. Sure. It's funny because I just uh, was doing some, uh, looking up some uh, numbers on Tesla recently, and I found that even, although our data only goes back uh, some six, eight years uh, on a just, you know, kind of stock by stock, day by day level, I went back and estimated P&L. It looks like from two, 2010, Tesla shorts are down around 42 billion in mark to market losses. Now, some of that is offset by uh, convertible bonds, options, and such. But if you're looking at your P&L on the equity side, they're down around $42 billion. Uh, and they're still in it. And Tesla is still the number one short in the market. It's uh, by far. It, and, uh, you know, the, the short sellers are still holding on to their positions. Um, it's the Teflon short. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just every day is, is a new story for Tesla. You, uh, you touched on a couple points. One... Um, is sh when you talk about the largest short, do you mean absolute size, not as a percentage of the float? And, and yeah. maybe use that as a jumping off point to talk about what short interest and, and how, what all that means. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it, this is always kind of something I talk to people about and, and there's a little misnomer in what the metric to use when you're looking at a short. So if you're looking at a small cap name, it's like, oh, it's got, you know, 45% short interest percentage of float, great. That's, you know, $40 million. So it's not really a big positional short in, in, you know, in the world, in the U.S. market. Where you've got something like Tesla, which has uh, only got, uh, you know, 7% seven seven change percent of its short interest as a percentage of flow, is, uh, what's it, $24 billion of short interest. So you've got every biggest, not every, but most big institutions have some sort of exposure to Tesla one way or another, you know, either on the long side or the short side. And it's a play that uh, you know just keeps going up and down. It's it's you know the number two is is uh, you know, Alibaba with eleven billion dollars and Apple with nine billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's by far the most popular short in the market. Uh, shortage percentage float is a is an interesting metric. Uh, we actually have kind of augmented that a, a bit, which I'll like talk about later. But uh, you know, when you're looking at comparison comparisons to you know one of the big shorts, look at notional short short value. No one really cares how many chips you put on a, on the poker table when you bet. You really want to know what the color of those chips are. So uh, you know, if someone's throwing out a hundred dollar chip, it's a, it's a bigger bet than someone throwing out you know five dollar chips. Um, you know, it's it's funny as we're on the topic of Tesla because uh, I just looked it up. It reminded me I had an exchange with Elon in 2018 on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just read you the highlights real quick because it's kind of funny and I and I think illustrative of, of how I think about shorting. Um, we had a old school uh, short seller, Tom Barton on the podcast, uh, who goes back, you know, decades. And um, I said, he'd, he'd exposed a lot of frauds and scams, predatory. And this is one of the key benefits of having shorts is yeah. the sort of forensic ability. And Elon had, had tweeted, he said, what the shorts should do, uh, what the shorts do should be illegal. And I said, look, I love Elon and Tesla, but this is backwards. Not all shorts are bad. Not all longs are good. You know, people have incentive to kind of talk their book. And, uh, you know, Elon started talking about, he said, you know, shorting applied to the market of holes, obviously a net negative and in sense negative GDP. It stops private companies from going public. It gets into all these sort of like weird arguments. Um, right. But, but basically, you know, I came into it and said, look, you know, as a, um, I said a lot, there's a lot of good fund companies that do short lending and return it to shareholders. And so in cases that is a great benefit to the end shareholders. And I said, at the end of the day, it's like, if you just execute as a company, you don't have to worry about all, all these shorts are doing because they'll initially, they'll eventually get lit on fire. Yeah. <laughs> any, yeah. any general thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I, one thing that people look at is short interest and say, oh my God, it's got a big short interest. Well, if someone executes a short, that's their effect on the market is gone. It's finished. It's just like a long shareholder who bought a hundred shares and wrote it from, you know, 50 bucks to 70 bucks. He's not affecting the price of the market just because he's holding his stock long. Same thing with a short seller. Once they executed their short sale, they're not affecting the stock price, but what they do, what they are is they're, they have uh, dry powder, they're a potential buy. So when a short seller, whether he's making money or losing money, eventually he's got to close out his position. So he is a, a potential buy in the market. So there's, 
a uh, we talk to a lot of long shareholders, long side, you know, mutual funds, long only guys. And they want to know what the shorts are doing. Why? Because if a short is closing down its position, if, if all of a sudden if we're seeing short interest dropping from you know, 600 million to 500 million, it's like, wow, shorts are getting out. This is putting upward pressure on the stock price. So, you know, when people say, oh, it's shorts only kill the stock price, no, they have, there's a two way street in their activity. But remember, there's a lot of short activity that's used as hedging. So you, you're hedging your portfolio, you're hedging your options, you're hedging your, your convertible bonds. So it has a use not just as pure alpha, it, it's, a, it's an offset to a trade. And, you know, short sellers are also looking for momentum. So, you know, if I'm a momentum trader, you know, I, I'm trading with one hand tied behind my back if I'm only buying stock. Because, you know, I'm seeing run-ups in the stock and I go, wow, it hit the top. Well, smart trader, a good trader, should be saying, close up my, my long, initiate a short, let's make some money on the downside. And run that down, close that up. I, look, I mean, you can make a ton of money just by riding the, the waves of a stock as, as a momentum player. And that's what we're seeing in the market now. Um, tell me a little more about the landscape of how uh, people are using um, short selling. You know, the, the, the use, you touched on it briefly. And mm -hmm. the first thing is everyone just assumes shorts, it's going down. That's right. my bet. But in reality, it's, it's often market neutral. There's long short. There's short against the buy. I mean, there's a million different ways yeah. that people kind of – any other general thoughts on kind of um, – because you, you probably get a chat with – all types yeah, of yeah exactly uh, by side yeah i mean you get a lot of analysts who look at are looking at a sector so you're, you're picking a, a sector semiconductors or whatever it is uh automobiles and you're saying best of breed worst of breed now you did all this work on looking at 40 names well i can actually buy the best and i'm looking at say this is the best stock in the sector buy that one and this is the worst stock in the sector it's gonna have the underperformance well instead of just buying the buying the best let me leverage up my position by buy the best, short the worst, and I can do my trades. I've got leverage. I can do it once, two, three, four, five times, and I can actually augment my PL by making slightly less because I've got a net offset, but I'm doing it five times, so I'm making more on a gross. So it's allowing me to put, use my money more efficiently and put on bigger bets by using other people's money, the prime brokers. Now, again, you got to be able to manage your position. There's a lot, you know, a lot more complexity in this, but it allows you to kind of put on bigger bets and put on bets that are, that are a little more wide ranging in the, in the sector. You, you can kind of saying, you yeah, know, this is better, this is worse for the time being. Well, I want to offset this long with this short because you know, I'm kind of managing my risk exposure. Um, and, and it becomes more of a, not just an alpha play, not just a play to make money, but it's also a play, way to protect your portfolio. If I'm long a whole bunch of tech stock, you know what, maybe I'd be shorting the QQQs. You know, if I'm thinking that there's some sort of a QQQ ETF, which is a NASDAQ ETF, I'm looking to give myself some downside. I know I love these 12 stocks, but you know what? The sector might have some issues with it. So you know what? Let me go short the sector because there might be some problems overall, but these five or six or 10 stocks are gonna way outperform. That's how, you, that's how the shorting, the shorting the ETF helps you manage your risk and give you better performance overall. You know, um, I, I want to talk one, one more minute about uh, yeah. this concept of the short lending for the longs. As you mentioned, in some cases, it's basis points, but in some cases, it's dozens, if not hundreds of basis right. points to the fund shareholders in the vast majority. I mean, if it's not 70%, it's 90% of end investors are unaware of uh, this process um, and, and how much it could benefit the end investor. Do you have any general thoughts on the lay of the land on the industry? Um, does everyone do it? Do only the good guys do it? Do a lot of people just keep it? Uh, from the long book of people lending it right. out, how, how are people kind of going about it? Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why we have a lot of uh, long only investors using our platform. because we're actually, we're actually helping them manage their book on the stock lending side. So a guy who is a great stock picker or, you know, is, is, is uh, is, has this big portfolio of you know, maybe a sector that they're long in a particular uh, mutual fund or ETF, uh, has no clue what stock is hot or cold in, in the stock loan market. And you know, if you're a long GameStop, well, it's criminal that you're not making 100% return for your, for, your, uh, for your investors. I mean, it, it's, it's a huge amount of money. What we see is that most of the big guys do lend 
Um, most of them do pay it back to investors, there are some that don't. It's, it's uh, again, that's uh, you know, specific to each of the fund manager. Uh, there are still a good amount of uh, ETFs and long only guys that don't lend at all. And, you know, they do the, uh, they always give us the, uh, I don't want to hurt my positions by, by helping the shorts. The problem is, is that his incremental loan is not going to be hurting the, the, the affecting the stock price that much. And basically, if I'm not borrowing from your portfolio, I'm borrowing from someone else's. It's not like you're stopping the short from, from doing his, uh, his damage or his trade. He's borrowing it from somewhere else. So why shouldn't you and your investors make some, make some money on it? And you're right. For the most part, if you look at a portfolio of the you know, ISP 500 names, your return is, what, 30 to 50 basis points. But it's still, when you're talking about, on an average basis, the S&P returning 6 to 8% a year, if I can knock on an extra 50%, 50 basis points to that total, now you've just jumped a quintile in your rankings because you're lending the stock. And uh, therefore, you know, pension fund or invest, investment, uh, you know, for something like that, that makes, that makes a difference to their returns. Uh, and it can make a big difference, you know, in a world where we are today, which is so many investors focus uh, almost exclusively on expense ratio. We tell a lot of people, we say in many cases, you can have actual ETFs or funds that have a higher short lending revenue than the expense ratio. And so in Absolutely. my mind, for all intents and purposes, you have a negative expense ratio, which means you are being paid to own this fund. And that usually blows people's minds. Um, you know, they're like, it's, it's like not even, does not compute. <laughs> you know, yes. it's just something where people are like, what? Not to take advantage of sec lending is, is really doing a disservice. And you know what? You can get some home runs. I mean, there are some stocks, like you said, 10%, 15 20% for a good amount of time. And all of a sudden, you're not just covering expenses, you're creating alpha. How, how much does the um, loan rate vary? I mean, is this like a day-to-day -day thing? Is this like, yeah, it's pretty stable? Does it uh, vary? You know, the example you were using is GameStop or even something like an, uh, an Apple or a Tesla. Right. Is that something that uh, changes not really from month to month or changes a lot day to day? All right, just uh, in general, uh, there are some 12,000, 15,000, 12,000, 15,000 shorts in the US market. Uh, most of the names are really small, have small short interest, but on average, the average stock borrow fee is around 70 basis points for everything. Uh, now you've got the GC, which is 30 basis points. So the interesting thing with stock loan, it's uh, it's not a linear increase of rates, it's exponential. So basically, everything is GC, 30 basis points, until it's not. And you might go through 90% uh, of, uh, of uh, 90, over 90% of the stocks are GC, or easy to borrow, your Apples, your Exxons, you know, all the easy names. Now you get this uh, uh, inflection point where utilization where usage of whatever stock is available to borrow gets to a point where its rates go up. And then things go up really on an exponential way where, where you go from zero, from 30 basis points to one, to five, to 10, to 20, to 50. Problem is not many stocks get in that far into that curve, but when they do, rates go up a lot. So like I said, over 90% are gonna stay around GC, 30 to 50 basis points. And you've got probably another five to 8% of stocks are going in that 1% to 5%. And then the rates change on a daily basis. So basically, if I'm going out there as a stock loan guy, I'm shopping the street to see what, I'm, I'm shopping the street for not only rate, but I'm shopping for quality of borrow. So if I know that you have a, a fund that sells the hell out of his, you know, churns his man's book all the time, and so it's in and out of stock. Well, you know what, I might not, for me to borrow your stock, you have to give me a better rate because I might have to replace that stock borrow pretty soon. If I'm talking to a pension fund that basically holds the stock for 20 years because you know, they're not sellers, they're just accumulators, well, then I'm going to pay a higher rate to borrow his stock. And it, it kind of keeps going, you know, that, that balance keeps going up and down. The lender's job is to kind of make sure that they get the best rate possible. So it's kind of like a, uh, a auto dealer that says, hey, this is the last red Corvette on the lot. You better buy it now. Um, you, you know, it's going to cost you, you know, 20 grand over MSRP because it's the last one. Well, the thing is, he's got... 20 other cars in his, in his back lot, but he's trying to make you think that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, that the, there's not many cars out there to buy. So 
Or as a lender, he's trying to increase his bar rates. As a borrower, I'm trying to shop the street and get it, get it as cheap as possible for my short seller. So there's always this market dynamic in, in that stock loan. And, and a lot of people um, unfamiliar to the area, you know, get concerned because they say, well, there's risk involved. The, um, you know, the, the short seller may go bankrupt and blow up their fund and never return the fund. Walk, walk us through uh, how that actually works with posting collateral. What's the typical sort of ballpark uh, collateral today that, that people ask for? All right. So uh, it's a great point because it's uh, people are scared because they hear these stories about uh, stock loan blowing up a fund and, and now they're short cash and, and you know, they've got to uh, uh, close up or release, so, you know, show a big loss. Uh, number one, there's no real losses on the stone stock loan side of the transaction. Every transaction that's stock loan is marked to market daily with 102 to 105 percent collateral put up. So uh, if I'm borrowing $100 worth of Tesla, I'm putting up $102 worth of cash. And the lender holds on to that cash, he takes that cash and he reinvests it. Now, that's where the issue is. Where do you reinvest your cash? And that's where the risk is. And that's what the lender has to, has to take care of, but it has nothing to do with the specific stock loan transaction. So if on a daily basis, if my stock price goes up, I got to put up my collateral. If my stock price goes down, I, I get collateral back. And that cash exchange happens every day uh, and it basically keeps the lender safe and keeps him uh, keeps him solvent. What other lenders do is uh, they also minimize their risk by, by minimizing their uh, allocation and their concentration to various counterparties. So if I'm a lender, I'm not lending all my stock to uh, you know one prime broker or one uh, one short one hedge fund. I'm saying hey you know my systems are smart enough to say I'm only lending out 40% or 30% or 50% of my, any particular name to only to any one user. So I'm spreading my counterparty risk. So it's not just risk of, uh, you know, mark to market price risk, now you got counterparty risk that you're kind of taking care of by spreading out to your, your positions. You know, if one hedge fund wants it, another hedge fund wants it, it's easy to spread out your risk. I imagine a lot of listeners are hearing this and saying, wait a minute, you mean if I own a stock, I could have a borrow rate that's more than 100%. I imagine a lot of people are listening say, why wouldn't I just go and buy the top 10 or 20 most shorted stocks and lend them out? Even if it was 10% revenue, that would be a pretty great revenue. Any general thoughts on that? Why, do, why isn't it that easy? Why doesn't it work like that? Uh, well, uh, the biggest prime workers do that all day long. Uh, what you're doing is you're, you're uh, going long the biggest, most expensive stock borrows. Uh, you're hedging them out using either options or ETFs or uh, swaps. Uh, you know, you're kind of hedging out some of your risk. You're just earning, earning that uh, stock borrow fee. That's a, you're able to do that because most of the most of the street is not really educated in what the fee is. So, if a option writer is not doesn't realize that his R and his uh, and his uh, calculation is got a, should be over a hundred percent. That's what the stock borrow fee is. And he's pricing it using 50, 60, 40, whatever, whatever rate he is, he's underpricing his option. So as a broker or as an investor who's really adept and, and kind of looks at the market, you go, holy crap, I can actually buy this stock, lend it out for 100, buy an option to hedge myself. I got no risk on the price and I'm making a net 30, 40% return for the duration of my option. So yeah, it happens. Uh, we have clients who do that. We have, uh, there are prime brokers that do that all day long. There's, there's a lot of money to be made. One of, the, one of the biggest challenges as a quant, you know, I spent years uh, ago trying to model out the various impacts of um, strategies that involve shorting stocks. And, and one of the biggest challenges you see um, in a lot of the short academic literature and implementation is it, it to me, it, it's not necessarily that grounded in reality, potentially, because you, it's so yes. hard to find the stock data and it changes so frequently and then it's fragmented and it doesn't go back that far. All right. these things, I mean, I was trying to come up with all these different strategies and I'm like, how do these people make all these assumptions? Because that's not 
probably what it <laughs> would have looked like in the past. Yeah, yeah, this is your, your, your Econ 101 where your professor says, well, assume a risk-free trade with no transaction costs and automatic execution at the perfect bid ask. And, you know, it's complete, uh, it's garbage because, uh, you know, unless you have this data, you, know, you really can't make those kind of, a lot of the things that, that, that I see in, the, in, the, in these uh, papers don't really work in real life. It's a great idea, and it makes kind of sense in a, in a uh, uh, educated, in, in, uh, in the, you know, the ivory towers, but uh, when you're out there you know, hitting the bid, you know, it's not exactly the way the market works. Uh, we actually are starting to give our data out to some academics to use in their reports, and their, and their research, because we do have daily data. They come in and they see our data and they go, holy crap. I say, I've never been able to see, see this before. And I say, yeah, we've, our algo calculates intraday short interest so you're getting a daily data. And, and I go out, we have a stock loan desk and that, that goes out to the street. So I'm, I'm pinging the street to see what the rate is on Nikola and the rate is on GameStop. So I'm not just getting feeds or whatever. I'm, I'm actually, we're actually seeing what the true market is and we're adjusting our system to say, yeah, a rate on, uh, existing trades on uh, GameStop is 55%. We're seeing new borrows at 100 to 250%. So the, we're telling you what the incremental piece is as well as the, the, the existing cost. And that's something that maybe a short sellers really don't understand is that stock loan rates are very, very sticky. They go up slowly, they go down slowly. So even though the, it's not like, a, you're, not like everyone's getting, if you own a share of IBM, everyone's getting the same price of IBM at 401. Stock loan, one guy's getting charged 50%, another guy's getting charged 25%, another guy's getting charged 150%. All are fair and, and good rates because it depends on when you got on the position, how big your position is, and where your position is sitting. So if you're at a shitty broker that's charging you, that's a huge bid on their side to, to, to borrow the stock, and you got in late to the trade, you're paying 150%. If you're at a good prime broker, you're a good client at the prime broker, your position is you know, not huge, but it's, 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 it's a big, steady position you had on, you're probably only getting charged 50%. So there's a huge variability between rates. You know, we, um, we're chatting mostly about the institutional world. I, I had a tweet the other day, this is getting a little off topic, so we'll, we'll come mm -hmm. back to a yeah. topic, um, but it's a normal conversation with me. Um, and I said, if you think about the traditional retail brokerages, there's like four main ways traditionally they made money. One was commissions, which are for the most part gone. Right. Um, one is interest spread on cash balances. Your money is in cash at zero. They, they um, invested at a higher amount. And that's a big one for places like Schwab. Absolutely. Uh, and the other two, there's short lending revenue and also payment for order flow. And I said, I was curious. I said, I wonder, you know, it's very one-off bespoke and traditionally focused only on high net worth. I said, I wonder if you'll see any brokerages develop that offer to share part of that revenue with the end investor. Um, is that something you think is possible, improbable, likely, none of the above? It's actually happening, shockingly. Uh, you've got some of the big uh, retail brokers actually have an internal stock loan desk, which is sharing revenues with their clients. The catch is they're not offering necessarily you have to ask for it. so if you don't know that GameStop is doing 50 to 100 percent fee they're not saying hey take some of my revenues yeah. so they're there there but if I go to King them and say hey I got a fully paid for account let me open up a uh, stock loan agreement with you because you know there's a lot of technicalities in, in lending stock and say hey take my GameStop and say you know what great we'll pay you you know 45 out of the 50 or whatever and you're gonna earn some income. Um, what they will do though, if they see an expensive stock that they really need, then they'll go knock on your door. So if I need Nikola stock, because I got a lot of people looking to short and I can't get my hands on stuff, they'll start knocking on these uh, long shareholders door and I'd say, hey, you know what, guess what? Yeah, I can make you 15% return if you lend me your Nikola stock. And then you'll get this uh, action on the stock loan what, side. What's the, what's, what's Nicola going? What's the rate ballpark right now? Uh, Nicola, oh, it's a lot less. It's around 10 ish now. So it's, okay. it's, uh, it's, it's uh, come down quite a bit. Right. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was laughing so hard when, when the, all the retail brokerages started to go commission free. I don't know. Yeah. Was that this year? Le this year, last yeah, year? I can't last remember. Year. Yeah. Um, and Schwab, Charles Schwab came out and look, they've, they've been a, 
industry pioneer, but I, I'm going to give him a little shit here because he came out in public. He's like, I've always hated commissions. I want them to go away. I'm like, oh, really? You've charged them for 40 years. And just now, just because everyone else went to zero, you're finding religion? Come on. And so it's, this is sort of a similar concept I'm thinking in my head where, yeah. you know, n no one is going to do it until their hand is forced. But it seems like you could come up with a brokerage that says, look, you pay us a certain fee, um, whatever it may be, basis point or percentage of, but, but if you framed it as yield or say, look, you're going to potentially get this much yield on your account because if we do all these things, we share in the payment for order flow, we share in the stock lending. Anyway, someone yeah. listening, take the idea and run with it. I don't want to do it too much work, but. <laughs> no, you're right, man. It's, it, there is a lot of cash. People don't understand how many, how much cash flow there is in a, brokerage account, the different ways that brokers uh, make money or, or, you know, cost them money. I mean, you're going out and taking that cash and you're reinvesting in certain, you're lending it to other clients that have had a big, you're, you're taking the stock and you're lending that. I mean, I remember one time, again, I know the market, so was, we can't invest in stocks because I we see too much data. So we could do ETFs. We have a whole theory for ETFs. So I saw a long short, short play in some uh, uh, fixed income ETF, uh, ETF trade. I want to go longer, some of the uh, longer yield ETFs and go shorter, one of the shorter yield ETFs. So I put the trade on and I know that the rate was around a one, one and a half percent. So I get my brokerage report and this is what retail investors should really understand. Find where the stock loan costs are in your brokerage report. It's buried. Mm -hmm. It's hidden. It's, it's in a column that you really don't understand. So I'm looking, I see this 7% cost. I'm like, what, what the hell is that? So I kind of dug through a little further into things. I said, oh my God, you charged me 7% for the stock borrow that I know is going for a point, point and a half. So I called up my broker and I said, all right, what's, what's going on? I don't know, that's the rate. I go, listen, I trade with your guy. So he's, I, that, that lent you the stock. I said, let me, call, let me call Mike and tell him that I will get him the stock so he can replace it and charge me the fair rate. No, we can't do that. You know, so they were, at one point they were charging 600 basis points spread on the mm. stock borrow. It's God. so it's now, bad. now it's kind of turning around where they're not doing that because the no, the noise and the, uh, and the knowledge is probably there where shorts are finally starting to, or even long shareholders are finally starting to realize, you know, what their, what the assets they're holding. I love it when I, you know, I mentioned somebody, you mentioned my Twitter feed, you know, I'll mention to a couple of my Twitter guys and they'll come back to me and say, wow, I'm making, you know, uh, you know, 3% uh, on this stock that I never knew I could make. I said, yeah, it's, you know, Good for you. You're taking advantage of what, uh, what the market really is. Yeah, this is the whole key on everything involving Wall Street and our world is you have to find a partnership where the interests are aligned and, yes. you know, where people are on the same side. And I, I giving Schwab crap, but they have an offering that's a fiduciary offering their robo advisor that intentionally puts people in a huge cash slug paying essentially it's like a, i don't think it was 100 basis points lower than it could have been but it's close right. and i made the argument i was like can you be a fiduciary and do that i don't think you can um anyway yeah. find find you find you someone who is on your same side uh in every aspect of right. um, not just finance but the world um yeah yeah you know it's it's a big deal when you talk about you talk about the, you know making sure that you know what's going on i mean stock loan can either turn a trade into a winner or a loser, you know, because of the cost. So if you're long stock that's, you know, earning you 3%, but you can make 10% on the stock loan side, hey, you know what, I might want to stay in that stock. So it's a yeah. big investment decision. Yeah, and it's, it's like when you think about the things that people consider, particularly on the retail, even professional advisors, um, one of the challenges, there's not that much um, – info and it's also backward looking for funds you know you, they you can put it in the, i think the prospectus or annual report on how much revenue you got from the, the stock loan but obviously it's not gonna be the same going forward I, it would be nice to see morningstar start to incorporate some of this or some of these yeah. fund websites incorporate the amount because it's it's often far more significant than the expense ratio um yeah. while we're on the topic of etfs and funds any general takeaways, trends, how things have been going? Um, have they changed the game uh, by the baskets and the passive over the last decade or so? Any 
any general thoughts there? On ETFs, uh, what I do know is that the stock loan has become a bigger por uh, portion of their uh, activities. Uh, we have a lot of guys on the ETF side that are actively lending. I think they're actually making some investment decisions on, on some of their long only positions based on what they can get in the market. So if I'm torn between holding you know, a couple of names, even you know, whether it's a bond or, or an equity, and I can make an extra you know, a couple of points on the, on the financing side, you know, they'll, that affects their decisions now. Um, what we do is we give uh, ETFs and long only guys uh, you know, a, a, a insight into what their portfolio is making. So like you said, it can cover expenses and, and add, add to their alpha. Uh, and it's funny because on the short side, we're seeing uh, people trading ETFs and actually I'm seeing less activity than some of the like ETFs that have higher stock borrow fees. So, I mean, in this, in this world, there's so many ETFs that are so close in performance and holdings. Um, I'll actually see some of the more expensive stock borrow ETFs on the short side go down and a like one go up. And I'm wondering what's going on. And I realized that some smart investor who, who realized, hey, why am I shorting this one, this S&P 500 ETF, and paying 80 basis points when I can, borrow, when I can short this one for 30? So it's not only just management fees, it's also you know, stock borrow fees on the short side that matter. We have we have good friend Corey Hofstein, who once jokingly years ago said there was a, a particular corporate bond ETF. It may have been J&K, but it's sort of irrelevant, and this was a while back. But there was a pretty high stock borrow on J&K, and in tongue in cheek, he says, I'm going to launch a new ETF. All it does is own J&K and lends it out. And it's going to have a higher return yes. than buying J&K. And I was like, this is some sort of like Russian doll. Uh, that, just, is, that is so true. <laughs> but it, but it, so true. the math works out. He said, yeah. I can make a spread. But yeah, yeah that was yeah. Really, really funny. Um, but it's, it's really interesting you point this out because, you know, the considerations people put into – picking a fund. And like you mentioned, there's so many that even if they have different indexes or approaches or essentially the same fund, this has been going on with, with active mutual funds for uh, you know decades where they're kind of closet index versions of each other. And so the thing that everyone looks at is expense ratio. Maybe they look at uh, trading market impact of the bid ask and liquidity, but the next one being the short lending revenue could be bigger than both. And that's just yeah. something, and taxes, of course, some people think about taxes, mm -hmm. but um, it'll be interesting to see much more of the, the trade optimization by allocators based on that concept. And I actually don't know, this is a good question, and maybe you know more than I do, um, on do most investment advisors, so RIAs, financial planners mm -hmm. at Morgan Merrill, wirehouses, but plus all the independents, um, I don't think they, they do short lending on the majority of client portfolios by default either. Any, do you know? Yeah, back in the day, what we used to do was uh, we would actually contact these guys when I worked at the Morgan Stanley Stock Club desk. We actually call them up and say, hey, you're, you know, we look at the uh, big holders of a, of a stock yeah. and, and say, hey, your guy owns this. And we, we find out who the, uh, who the uh, RA was. And I uh, would say, talk to him. Let's see if I can borrow this stock. Uh, I mean, you would hope that eventually uh, you'd have this, uh, especially with the, with the ease of information flow now, that a investment advisor should have a screen that says, you know, here's my return, here's a return of uh, on Apple, or and, and here's also the stock loan revenue you can generate. So this way, at least, uh, you know, they can help their uh, do their fiduciary responsibility and lend out the stock. So, so where do they go for that info? And, and this could be a good transition into what you guys are up to at S3. Yeah. Um, if, if Joe E-Trade wants to go find stock borrow rates, like, or, or is there an accepted place to go? Is it pretty opaque? Is it impossible to find? What's the sort of uh, status quo? Yeah, so you can always call your broker. Uh, but again, that's his viewpoint. So if you got a guy who uh, has no book, in this name and is looking and is calling up and say, Hey, what's, uh, you know, what's this rate? You know, he gets some um, off market or scale rate. Uh, you know, what we have is uh, a black app, which is a, our, uh, which is our most uh, profitable, uh, most uh, active uh, uh, use on our system. And you get it through Bloomberg and, and Refinitiv and uh, 
We have a retail app that's kind of scaled down version of that. And basically you can put in your portfolio and you can see what stock loan activity is and stock loan rates live uh, real time uh, on your portfolio, on your stocks. And uh, we have the stock loan desk, which is uh, myself and a couple other guys at, at S3 that we have phone calls and, and, uh, and, and uh, emails all day long for, from uh, institutionals and, and large individuals that say, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm long uh, you know, Turtle Beach and uh, you know, I hear that's got some stock loan returns coming. You know, what's the rate today so I can go back to my broker and make sure he's paid me a fair amount. Um, so the Black App is, is a big, uh, big seller for us. It's a big, uh, the clients love it because you can actually populate it with your own portfolio and manage your own book. And, uh, and you'll see historical stock loan activity, you'll see historical rates, you'll see, you see uh, you know, what's going on in like security. So if I'm along one name and I'm saying, well, you know, I wanna be what's going on in the other names in the same sector or the same family of stocks, you can kind of check it and see what the stock loan activity is on those. And- uh, You say it's called the Black App? Yeah, it's called the Black App. And uh, it's, uh, it's the number one retail uh, selling app on, uh, on Bloomberg. So you know, we've really got a lot of good traction there. We also provide the data if you're on Bloomberg or Infinitive or uh, we provide data to FactSag, we provide data to NASDAQ on the short sides. So we'll tell people what the short interest is and what rates are in, in stocks. Um, it's, uh, we're trying to disseminate the information because it doesn't exist anywhere. It doesn't exist in a, in a timely manner or in a uh, unbiased manner elsewhere. Like I said, we don't hold positions, we don't, we don't trade, we don't, uh, we're basically collecting data, uh, normalizing it, using our algo to kind of get it, get it cleaner and, and better. And we spin it out to the market and say, hey, use this because it's, it's, it's something that you need to do to you know, make your investment strategies better. What's, what's the most typical client breakdown for you guys? Is it buy side? Is it sell side? Is it short sellers? Is it data it's providers? Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's hedge funds, uh, which are big. hedge funds and long only guys. So uh, we first started out servicing the hedge fund industry, but but uh, ended up being a big provider to the uh, long onlys, just because like, you know, you, you nailed it in the head, it's an opaque market. And they were getting uh, uh, not the fair end of the stick uh, with, uh, with a lot of their revenues. So uh, these long side guys really like to see, number one, what kind of income they're gonna get. But number two, they wanna know what the shorts are doing in their names. So if I'm along a stock and it's and I'm seeing the shorts building positions, maybe it's time for me to take a look at that stock and say, why are the shorts, you know, coming in hard? You know, is it time for me to get out or should I have to revisit my investment strategy? And and uh, that's been a big big piece of our uh, our analytics is is people want to see rotational moves. They want to see that hey, the shorts are are uh, you know getting out of one sector, or getting into another sector. Where where's where are the moves? Everyone knows what the long side's doing but not many people know what the short side's doing. Um, you guys put out a lot of uh, pretty in-depth research and for people that want to get in the weeds, we'll, we'll post show note links to your website and some of cool. these articles. Um, maybe touch on some of the ideas you guys are thinking about, excited about. You have a, a pretty fun article talking about short interest and better ways to uh, uh, you know, think about that as a percentage of float. Any of those in general you want to talk about that you guys have been researching and thinking about? Yeah, that's actually one of my uh, little pet projects there. I kept getting questions about uh, some ETFs that had over 100% short interest percentage of flow. XRT was one. It's a handful of them. And a handful of stocks that also uh, have, uh, you know, higher than 100% short interest percentage of flow. And I couldn't really, if that's what you asked me, how is that possible? I go, well, it really isn't. I mean, you can only get, you know, you can't get five quarts of milk out of a gallon jug. It's, it's, it's only so many stock borrowers out there. So there's no way to, to have 120% short interest percentage flow. So I sat back and said, why is that happening? And uh, going back to my you know, controller days and, and, and uh, prime broker days, I was like, wait a minute, let me just do the, uh, uh, the flows of a transaction. I realized that every short creates a synthetic law. So, um, so you as a beneficial owner lending stock uh, and the short seller is selling it, well, there's someone buying that stock. So the beneficial owner is still long the stock, short seller is short the stock, and that new buyer is long the stock. So in effect, you've got two long shares and one short share. Well, that long share can now be relent also. So that's sitting in a, uh, in a prime brokerage uh, margin account 
or in a hedge fund that has the stock reapothecated. So now the buy broker takes that in one share, he can lend it out to another short seller, and that's so that another buyer buys that share. So now you got three shares of stock instead of one. So it doesn't change the market uh, for the company itself. They're only paying out one dividend, they're only getting one vote. But in the middle, you've got three guys that actually have long exposure to the stock. And uh, so what we've come up with is, a, is the S3 short interest venture flow, which basically gives you really what the float is. So something like GameStop, where it's, uh, it's not at over 100%, it's actually 57%, which is more realistic, makes more sense. It's, uh, so we're basically saying that it's float plus the synthetic longs, it's really what the denominator in this formula should be not just the flow. Mm. So That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of get, giving people an idea of really what, what is, how many shares are really tradable in the market. Yeah. Um, what, what are some of the ways that people use y'all's data um, or just short data in general uh, that you think is interesting? And under that same sort of questioning, um, you know, any, any, best practices or do not use it this way because that's really yeah. dumb. Just any general thoughts on how kind of people interpret or misinterpret um, right. some of the stuff y'all put out? All right. Everyone's a great buyer of stock, whether it really is or they think they are, but that they're, they're good on the long side. Most people understand they're not really good on the short side. Some, some people do, some people uh, you know, are good. Some people are just kind of faking it and, and shorting whatever they hear. What, we, what we're able to do is create idea generation for, for uh, funds and for investors. If I give you a list of, if you're saying, wow, you have know, semiconductors or something, really I'd like to short some names there. Well, I don't need to have a team of 60 analysts going through the semiconductor stocks. Maybe I can just look at what the big movers in semiconductor short side is and follow along. This market is no longer a pure value uh, you know, kind of play market. It, it's really a momentum market for a lot of names. So why don't I get on the wave? So uh, so we have a lot of investors that are looking at our our uh, the short interest action in the street over the past week or past month and say, wow, everyone's shorting the hell out of the stock. Why? Oh, that makes good sense. Let me get in. So I don't have to have a three-week process where my analysts are trying to find the short. Other people have found the right. Let me, let me just ride the momentum. So there's a lot of momentum investing, which is the primary, seems like the primary investing that's going on in the market now are using our short side analytics to find the big momentum movers on the short side. And by piggybacking on those guys, you don't have to pay two and 20 either. That's a big, yeah, uh, that's, that's a big, big benefit. Book. I mean, we wrote yeah. a, we wrote a, we wrote a book on 13 F investing on the long side and found that often you could replicate the returns of a lot of these hedge funds. And in some cases, the returns were actually better because you weren't paying that huge VIG um, on, on what they're up to. Obviously, they, on the long side, you can't be trading that um, um, hyperactively. Otherwise, it won't show up in 13F. 13Fs may be, may be changing anyway. There's a bunch of new SEC right. proposals. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, Even on the ETF side, you know, we're looking, like I was looking at fixed income ETFs. And by looking at where the shorts are going in and out of, you know, I noticed that, wow, the shorts are, 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 are uh, going into the, uh, uh, the short of the, the uh, high yield ETFs and actually covering the, uh, the treasury ETFs. So they're saying, wow, you know, I want to, you know, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on in the fixed income market or in any sector just by seeing what the, uh, what the shorts are doing as well. Um. You've uh, been commenting on this space for a while and, and nothing really is more entertaining than the battleground stocks in short sell. I mean, Tesla has been like, uh, you know, the, the, use, the case study in this over the past few years and it's resolved in a very dramatic way, at least for now. Um, and then on the flip side, you have the Nikola. Any other... Uh, stories that you can recall that are particularly um, memorable when it comes to the short world? I mean, whether it's Volkswagen or uh, I would go way back, Brie yeah. um, anything that comes to mind as, to, as, in, uh, as yeah. a way of also thinking about a case study of how this works out and plays out, all that good stuff? Yeah, I mean, recently had Wirecard, which was another, another big name that the shorts were in. And it was, again, another 
Tesla esque. You know, you have these long short holders. I love the stock, and the short guys are coming in hard and heavy. Uh, there was a lot of uh, yeah, writings and commentary that really you know was uh, you know this stock sucks. This stock's a fraud. You know, and and the longs come back and they say you guys you guys are idiots. Uh, you know, it gets really vocal on both sides. But Wirecard was one of the again recently played out where the shorts were right. And uh, short interest uh, was steady, surprisingly. I, I thought for a while there with all the, all the commentary and the regulars coming in. And, uh, and you know, it, 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 I thought the shorts would, would acquiesce and kind of leave the trade and didn't. Um, and they ended up making a, making a nice uh, P&L on it. But they had to stay in and, and take it on the chin for a while. Um, you know, Port, uh, Volkswagen Porsche was just, you know, it still gives me the acid reflux. <laughs> uh, that was just nasty. It was quick. It was uh, it was nasty. I was at Morris Sale at the time. Um, it was just a trade that uh, happened so fast where the shorts got absolutely crushed. And uh, you know, we were sitting there trying to borrow stock, trying to help help uh, you know on a settlement day basis, help the position uh, settle, get people out of the position. Um, and you really couldn't do anything. You were just uh, you know sideswiped and and. Uh, you, know, you have to watch out for stocks. You have recently had the uh, the uh, leverage the oil ETF DG EWF AWF I can't remember uh, where shorts were, who were, you know lost hundreds of millions of dollars because the stock price went up to uh, fifteen thousand dollars a share in a couple of days. So if you weren't able to get out of your trade, so I can see these retail because. It, Who's trading the leverage ETFs? Well, mostly it's retail guys. You, you don't see many of the many of the monster hedge funds trading 3x leverage ETFs. Um, so I, I was sitting back. I go, oh my god, these guys got obliterated. They're going to come home, look at their uh, get. It, they're getting a call from their, from uh, E Trade or Schwab and saying, hi, you owe me you know, 600 million dollars in collateral uh, you know, on a 50 thousand dollar position. So uh, that was was scary. I mean, it's. Uh, it's uh, it just going to show you that you have to watch out on the short side because you know you can get killed. But that's such a one-off thing. That's I, I don't know how the, how uh, the exchange units let something like that happen. Some of these stories give me sweaty palms. Uh, listening to um, the shorting has always been near and dear to my heart. I, I think it's really hard. All my favorite short sellers like the forensic accounting guys they all right. have at least one maybe two screws loose like they're they're yeah. all just like uh and i say that in the most loving way possible they're all a little bit wonky and i think they do such a fantastic um community service but my god is it a hard, hard job uh and they ha must have a high tolerance for pain what do you think can you make a generalization um and if you can't that's fine mm -hmm as far as looking at like high short interest or um, other indicators, the batting average of the shorts, um, are they right a minority of the time? Are they right 90% of the time? Is it something that, uh, you know, on the, on the extreme examples, they're often right? Any general thoughts? Yeah, you know what the problem is, is that we're in an upward trending market for a long time. So the shorts got that going against them. They're, they're, they have two strikes on them right off the bat. So, you know, uh, where the, so Buffett who said that it doesn't matter that you're right, it matters that whether the market thinks you're right. Mm -hmm. um, so these guys might have the right idea, but if you've got the crowd, you know, pushing a stock up, it's, uh, you're going to lose money. So, uh, so we do see a lot of, a lot of uh, names, a lot, of, a lot of short sellers who are wrong just because, you know, right idea, market won't, market won't uh, look at reality. Um, for the most part, uh, you know, I just I don't think that most short sellers are uh, are profitable in uh, in a lot of their trades because they're not managing it right. Um, I think that uh, whereas a long seller is better at riding profits and cutting losses, you know, a lot of we see a lot of positions in short sellers kind of holding on because they know their thesis is right, they know their conviction is right. So I think they hold losses. A lot of times they're right in the long term, but in the meantime, they're taking a lot of mark-to-market uh, losses uh, and a lot of red ink uh, to their P&L. Um, you know, if you look at uh, Tesla, you know they're up uh, recently, 
So it's a timing issue. It's like, you know, if you put it, if you bought it a year ago, you're getting crushed. But if you bought it, uh, you know, a month ago, you're up. So, uh, so short selling and timing is a big deal. You got, you have to know where to get in and out of trades. Um, a lot of, uh, even institutional and retail guys are great at buying stock. They're, they're not so great shorting it. I think it's, 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 uh, it's a, uh, uh, a craft which uh, takes some uh, some effort and some some uh, seasoning and uh, and I think that uh, you know using something like R and you didn't have the information that, that's probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. things you really didn't have the information uh, on on a lot of uh, short selling so you use something like our system where hey this guy you know I see this stock is getting shorted big time you know get a little bit of that research already get a little bit of the momentum you know, run with that. And, and I think you become a better short seller. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go, you know, don't the, go against the tide. <laughs> the, uh, I used to say, and this is just an observation. I don't know how accurate it is. I'd say my, my belief is that most of the traditional long short equity guys um, use shorting as uh, like a, a PowerPoint justification for charging two and 20. And I say many, at least my experience as an allocator over the years, um, it's not their strong suit. Um, I, I personally would much rather have a dedicated short seller who's lived through, uh, uh, you know, a handful of years. Cause like you mentioned, position sizing and risk management, it's not just about being right. It's about how you approach the portfolio right. that has enough scars front and back of their chest, you know, that they've, yeah. they've, um, somebody like a Chanos who's, but, yeah. but then having the, you know, you Martingale keep going up against a position and, um, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough, uh, tough game. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, guys are short names and they, and, uh, and they get run out, you know, you, you short zoom communications, you know, you just get crushed and you get crushed quick. Yeah. You know, so if you're not nimble, you know, and say, wow, you know, I, I guess wrong or, or I thought the rally was going to end and I want to get it early and, and take the whole you know downside. Well, maybe you should wait and, and, you know, see the momentum down and then get into your short position. So it's like, you know, guys in that, you know, Zoom video is, you know, the down over a billion dollars this month in the uh, market market PL. So, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, it's, you know, $3 billion short down a billion dollars. You know, so uh, it's, it's a tough yeah. explainer. <laughs> What, um, you know, from someone who's had his fingers dirty with the data, probably more intimately than just about anyone out there, any other just kind of uh, lessons learned over the past number of years, and I'll include under that umbrella lessons learned, anything you particularly change your opinion on um, over the number of years uh, with, uh, with thinking about shorting and, and the data? Right. Um, Probably the best short sellers that, that you know are on our platform and we know of are uh, are where don't spread out their risk, uh, you know, too like too far. So you got to pick a handful of names that you're really really sure of that you really can manage, and uh, and uh, I don't see them putting on you know 70 names. You know, they're putting on you know five, 10, 15 names. Following that, putting on a big chunk of uh, of P and L. So. You know, if you have conviction, follow your conviction. It's uh, there's too many short names which lose money. So it's like if you spread out your your assets too far, you know, you're just taking losses in a lot of names. You know, and, and your two or three winners are getting you know the profits in those two or three winners get eaten up. Um, but the big thing I think now is I'm seeing is, is quickness in the market. Totally different from before. Before it was a lot of uh, you know. Best in, best in breed, worst in breed trading. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're doing you know sector rotations. Now it's like I see guys, I see in short interest going up and down really, really fast in a lot of names. So people are going in and out and kind of chopping in, saying, hey, you know, this market's, uh, you know, th this name is it's got some weakness. Let me short it for a while. Oh, look at that. That one's going. That one's getting weaker now. Let me get out of this one and get into this one. So we're seeing a lot more movement between names. Um, it's uh, it's a quicker market on the short side than I think it used to be. Did uh did sort of the volatility both down and then back up this year? Did that affect uh, a lot of the stock borrow or short landscape at all? Any general summaries of uh, the first few quarters of twenty twenty? Yeah, we we saw um, the market with you know going down by March you know uh, with the bottom in the March. 
we saw some short selling into that, not as much as I thought. I thought there'd be much more shorting into that drop. I think people uh, on the short side, or at least hedge funds or institutions, were looking for a floor quicker than it actually happened. So I didn't see as much short, new short selling during that March weakness. Uh, and again, on the upside, you know, I saw some short covering, but uh, I, again, I think people were kind of holding on to their positions and kind of saying, okay, this is going to come back. Um, what we're seeing now, like uh, within the last month, I'm seeing a lot of short covering. So it seems like the market or on the short side, it's saying that the downside uh, is over or it's, it's kind of flattening out and we're ready for an upturn. Uh, which kind of surprised me at an election. Uh, I thought that the shorts would be piling on a little bit more, uh, but uh, we're seeing some significant uh, short covering in a lot of sectors. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in the next two weeks. You know, before the we, uh, this has been unbelievably interesting. I'm going to wind down with a few last questions. What does the scene look like outside the U.S.? Is it as developed with the data and the analytics? Do people approach shorting and lending the same way? Is it something you can even get the same amount of data globally? Do you guys do it at all? How does that look? Yeah, we cover 40, 000, over 40,000 stocks worldwide. So we do actually have a big presence uh, overseas. Um, Europe, Asia, uh, you know, all the all Hong Kong, China, Japan, all of Europe, uh, Australia, uh, we cover all the markets. What we do, you don't have the regulatory, uh, you know, bi-weekly regulatory uh, reporting that you do in the U.S., but you do have, like an ESMA has uh, disclosures on uh, holdings over 0.5% to the public. We use that. We have other sources of data on transactions, trade volumes, uh, and such. Our algorithm uh, kind of uses all that and, and gives us short interest for all the names in uh, all the major names, all the major uh, countries. Um, Short selling is not quite as big in a lot of these countries, again, because a lot of times it's, uh, it's limited uh, regulatory wise. Uh, you know, they, there are certain countries which uh, uh, stop short selling at the drop of the hat uh, mm -hmm. uh, if there's something, if something goes wrong. But, uh, and there's a lot of rules of uh, you know, not being able to short sell certain stocks. So a lot of it's done in swap or, uh, or other uh, derivative forms. But it, it is active. I mean, there's, there's a ton of short selling in, in these other countries. And I think that uh, the spreads are a little bit bigger on this on the stock loan side. It's much more. It's a bit more expensive to short, so there is more income to be made if you're a long shareholder in, in, a, in, a, in a stock that's uh, hot. It's a hot short, but uh, it's uh, U.S. is definitely is by far the biggest market for short selling. Now. I'm always surprised when governments try to go the route of suspending short selling in a sector. I mean, the U.S. has done it in the past, and it seems yeah. like such a boneheaded move to me. But uh, you know. What do I know? No, um, it doesn't work. It, it's, uh, it's, it's that it too. Work. Yeah, <clears throat> the pricing doesn't re reflect the the the, uh, the effort they did and stop the short selling. Longs can still sell. Yeah. So it's uh, you know great. So you stop the short sellers, but longs are still selling and driving the price down. So I don't see you know unless you uh, make all selling illegal, or uh, then it doesn't really make sense. Hey, don't don't suggest it. The politicians may <laughs> may, uh, may listen to you. Um, Ior, do you have a most memorable investment over your career? Anything that comes to mind that you think about, good, bad, in between? Anything that just burned into your memory? Yeah. Well, personally, no. Unfortunately, every place I've worked at, I can't I can't buy or sell stock. So it's I've been I've been sitting on the sidelines looking at names. And I go, God, I wish I could do that. Uh, but uh, so I, so I don't have anything personally. What I what I do see that's uh, that's uh, you know, you know, on the on the flip side, I'm I'm still I still look at my uh, you know these tech stocks that I thought were overpriced at two hundred dollars a share, one hundred fifty dollars a share, and I'm saying, oh my god, these are all triple digit names. So I think that you know what we got is a momentum market, and I think the shorts, if the shorts look at the momentum side of the market as as much as the longs do, I think they'll become more profitable. I think it's something that retail investors and and institutional investors can do more often and really make a big effect to their net alpha in their, in their portfolios. I think I, need to, I think I need to implement that rule in my company is it can't own any security. My life would be so much happier. I, <laughs> I remove all the stress, uh, blood pressure goes down. I don't have to watch the markets anymore. I love that idea. Yeah, we uh, can do, yes, but that's about it. <laughs> Eeyore, where uh, do people go? They want to follow your writings. They want to get in touch with your company to chat about uh, what you guys are up to. Where do they go? 
Sure. Uh, you can you can catch me on Twitter at uh, ehors3. Uh, we have a website shortsite.com, which is uh, our website that we put on. Um, actually, most all my research goes on there, and a bunch of other commentary from other guys in our in our shop. Um, we have on Bloomberg and Refinitiv uh, our Black App. So you can type in Black App and uh, buy it from uh, the, the stores there and, and kind of use my data and uh, in your investment decisions. Uh, and we have a retail app too that you can actually catch on, on shortsite.com. So we wanted to have uh, something for the retail investors who aren't on these major uh, data distributors to uh, for them to be able to see uh, what's going on in the short side. I think that's helped a lot for, uh, for the guys who really want to try to short to have an idea of what's going on in the market. For the newbies out there, it's a deep, dark, one of the most interesting rabbit holes on the planet, all the uh, interest on the short uh, side. We'll add some uh, links to some books and some other resources too in the show notes, uh, mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. Ihor, uh, this has been so much fun. Thanks for joining us today. Oh man, it's been great. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. And, and hopefully we can do this again and uh, maybe talk about some stocks in depth and, uh, and help other, help more guys on the short side. Absolutely. Thanks.